Okay. And let me know when you want me to let them in. You can let them in. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Rosie Gomez, and I'm the Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor at the Administration for Native Americans, and I want to welcome you to the second webinar in our Native ECD webinar series. A reminder about the format of the series. Let's get to my next slide here. So we will have our welcome from our ANA Commissioner, Patrice Kunish, and our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development, Katie Hamm. We'll then follow that with an overview of this important topic of workforce. We will then have a facilitated conversation with three panelists. And after the facilitated conversation, our group of panelists will be included in separate breakout rooms to provide additional information and provide you an opportunity to ask questions. So I would now like to welcome the Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans, Patrice Kunish. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I'm having a bit of a um, coughing spell here, but let me greet you in the language of my Lakota relatives. Hello, my relatives. I greet you with a warm handshake and heart. I am so pleased that you are here with us today. Many of you returning uh, from our previous uh, webinar. And for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to our second part of our four-part webinar series on Native Early Childhood Development, Strategies for Supporting the Native Early Childhood Education Workforce. I'd like to thank the Office of Early Childhood Development and Deputy Assistant Secretary Katie Hamm at ACF for being such good partners with ANA to program this webinar series on Native Early Childhood Development. For those of you who did attend our first session, you know that early childhood development is a critical component of tribal self-determination. Research shows that quality early childhood education tends to lead to long-term social and economic benefits. Children who take part in early childhood education programs are more likely to be successful as teenagers and adults. They also are 25% more likely to graduate high school and four times more likely to complete a bachelor's degree, while less likely to face academic problems, including repeating grades or dropping out. And what is more is that children who learn their native languages during this period of development also show strong attributes of resiliency and problem solving, and the development of durable senses of identity, which are critical for carrying their native culture into the future. So for these reasons, the Administration for Native Americans values the importance of early childhood development in promoting the optimal growth, development, and well-being of both Native children and their families. Through our grant funding and engagements like today, ANA seeks to enhance nurturing early childhood experiences and healthy development during the child's early critical years. But of course, these programs depend on a dedicated, qualified, and committed workforce. A workforce like all others need support for the critically important day-to-day -day work they do. Our educators, caregivers and support staff are at the very heart of our early childhood programs and their well-being directly impacts 
the quality of education and care that our little ones receive every single day. Investing in our workforce is not just about providing them with adequate resources and fair compensation, it's also about creating an environment where they can thrive both professionally and personally. This means offering continuous opportunities for professional development, trainings that are relevant and accessible. It also involves fostering a supportive work environment where staff can achieve a wealthy work-life balance, feel valued, and then are also equipped with the tools they need to manage the demands of their roles effectively and without burnout. In short, when we invest in people, in the people who dedicate their lives to nurturing and educating our very youngest learners, we are investing in the future of Native communities. So in today's session, strategies for supporting the Native early childhood education workforce, we'll explore the importance of various retention efforts, ongoing training and education, work home life balance, compensation and benefits, incentives, and also preventing teacher and staff burnout. You also will learn how building agency and incorporating culturally focused strategies and other best practices can lead to better early childhood educational programs for teachers, staff, parents, and students. Thank you. I really appreciate you all being here with us today. And now I'll pass it over to Deputy Assistant Secretary Katie Ham for a few remarks. Thank you, Commissioner Kanish, and to the um, whole group at ANA for your partnership in supporting the urgent needs of the Native Early Childhood Workforce. At the Office of Early Childhood Development, we work closely with more than 520 tribes and tribal organizations across all of the programs that we administer. That includes the Child Care and Development Fund, Head Start, and Tribal Home Visiting. This work would not be possible without the dedicated workforce serving the tribal early childhood community. This workforce is truly the backbone of early childhood education and ensuring their needs are met is vital to the future of the communities that we serve. The well-being of the native early childhood workforce is inextricably linked to the well-being of the children and the families that they care for. The health and well-being of educators directly impacts the quality of care and the education that children receive as well. In tribal communities, early childhood education is not only about preparing children for school, it's about preserving the language, the culture, and the traditions. The workforce carries this legacy forward and passes down these traditions to children every day. And despite the critical importance of the work that you all do in the early childhood workforce, uh, the, the tribal early childhood workforce in particular faces many challenges. Teachers and staff in Native communities carry the compounded impact of historical and present day traumas. Over the last several years, we have heard from tribes through our listening sessions, tribal consultations, and site visits about these challenges, such as low wages, long demanding days, insufficient working conditions, few benefits, and inadequate facilities. Infrastructure challenges make commuting to positions in tribal communities challenging, and there's a housing crisis, leaving few options for affordable housing in or near tribal communities. These obstacles have led to recruitment retention and mental health challenges. We at ACF are committed to partnering with tribes to address these challenges. Reflecting on this commitment, we're excited to announce that the Office of Head Start recently released a final rule that reflects our commitment to need, meeting the needs of the early childhood workforce. These changes significantly increase, will significantly increase compensation for many Head Start staff and integrate better mental health services into Head Start programs more broadly. The strength of our communities lies in our children and the strength of our children lies in the hands of those who care for them from the very beginning of their lives. We're grateful for the many ways that the early childhood workforce provides care, resources, and compassion to the children and families that they serve. By supporting our early childhood educators, we are ensuring that children are not only prepared for the future, 
they're also deeply rooted in the culture and traditions that have sustained tribal communities for generations. Centering culture and language in the support and training provided to the workforce is critical in holistically supporting their well being as well. We look forward to hearing from several tribal communities today about the unique and innovative work they are doing to support the workforce. Thank you all so much for being here. And with that, I will hand it back to Commissioner Kanish. Thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Ham. We really appreciate all the support, all your leadership, and everything you do for early childhood. Next, we will welcome Saratha Largi to share her expertise in supporting the early childhood development workforce. Saratha serves as the Assistant Program Director for Navajo Technical University's Early Childhood Multicultural Education Program and is entering her third year in a PhD program at the University of Washington School of Social Work. Her professional experience includes roles as a toddler teacher, a mentor teacher, supervisor, manager of early childhood education, and training research assistant. She has worked extensively with federally funded programs dedicated to early childhood development, providing essential support to children and families and teachers in rural tribal communities. These diverse roles have deepened her commitment to supporting the holistic well-being of teachers from marginalized communities. Welcome, Saratha. Thank you for that introdu introdu introduction. Okay, first I'll start by introducing myself. Yat A Sha A Saratha Largi and Shia. Auto Net and Nishlinigi Kia Ani Nishlido at Tohana Bushes Teen. Greetings to each and every one of you. My name is Sarath Alarji. I'm of the Towering House clan and born for near the water. My maternal grandparents are of the Mud clan and my paternal grandparents are of the Edge Water. I'm a federally enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and I come from the Dine people. I grew up in the rural community of Nashville, New Mexico, and I'm originally from a place called Teyat It, a rock that stands tall or a pointed rock. And I now live in Seattle, Washington. As mentioned before, um, I currently serve as the Early Childhood Multicultural Education Program Director for Navajo Technical University. And I'm also entering the third year of my PhD program at the University of Washington, where I focus uh, my studies on early childhood care systems and interactions between tribal, state, and federal policy structures. I want to start by thanking the Office of Early Childhood Development and, Administ and the Administration of Children and Families for giving me the space and time to share with you some of the work that we are doing at Navajo Technical University to support the indigenous children and families of our communities um, through creating intentional support for um, our direct caregivers. To begin, I want to share a little bit about how I came to this work and also make it known that the multiple layers and aspects of my positionality is what drives my, drives my work. It is the teachings of my elders and thinking about the future of our children and our people is what guides my work. My elders have taught me through listening to their prayers and stories that it is not about me and you and the now. I was taught to not only think about the next generation, but to think about the many generations to come. I learned through sitting in ceremonies, being with my grandparents and watching my nieces and nephews come into this world to take their first breath, that life is sacred and our children are sacred. Children have the, the power to make us move and inspire us to be better people. Spending time with my grandparents and helping raise my nieces and nephews led me to be led me to be the caretaker for elderly, then a coach counselor for troubled youth in a juvenile facility, and a mental health assistant in a rehabilitation center for troubled youth. In each of these experiences, I was shown how important early childhood is and the significant impact we have as caregivers. That the impact that we have on the lives of the children, good and bad. That is what motivates me to, 
That is what motivated me to enter the field of early childhood. And I worked as a toddler teacher in early childhood care centers serving predominantly white children and families who could afford quality, quote unquote, quality care services. It was a beautiful experience to see what having resources could do for programming and the innovation that could take place. I left there hopeful and excited taking a position as a social worker for a tribal Head Start program. I learned quickly that our children became numbers under the federal umbrella. And I had to, I had limited to no physical interaction with teachers. This is what taught me that rural early childhood care systems are a different ballgame operating on different sets of rules. When talking to teachers about social emotional learning, I noticed that they saw it as a center in the classroom and not a way of being. So I took this and I applied to Navajo Technical University as an academic coach. I was hired to work with the tribal colleges and universities Head Start partnership grant that is meant to increase the number of highly, highly qualified Head Start workers. Coming into the role, I learned that we lack the infrastructure and mass support needed to ensure the success of the grant. So I spent the first year of my job building internal relationships and communications to ensure that the supports were able to, so that the students were able to receive the supports outlined in the grant initiatives. The beauty of the work, the beauty of working for Navajo Technical University is that we operate under the Dene philosophy of Sa'anage Bikehwajon and the framework of Nsa'ake's Nahata, Ina, and Sihasen. This means that we think first from the teachings of our elders and have the ability to develop curriculum on the terms of our people through our internal process of thinking and planning. Through the partnership, we have strengthened the relationship between our tribal college and the Federal Office of Head Start and the Navajo Head Start program. And we have intentionally designed accelerated programs that are infused with cultural teachings. We have also provided um, success workshops that are focused on yeah, our term for kinship, which teaches us about holistic self-care. Our, support, our supports also meet the socioeconomic challenges of our community by providing tuition support, textbook support, student fee support, and a merit-based stipend tied to our grade, tied to their grades along with food cards and gap cards. In the, in our, it's a very holistically designed program meant to ensure the success of our training teachers. As a final note to these, these experiences, it was emphasized to me that our elders are the strengths and the roots and are pillars of our communities. In contrast, Euro-America and colonialism hold in high regard and rank people with academic degrees as the greatest influencers and with the strongest voices. This is why it's important to inform and demonstrate to our students the value of an accredited degree and licensure in the appropriate field of study and show them that it is necessary. It is not only about power, it is about creating opportunities for indigenous voices that have been silenced in our world of academia and systems. This is only the tiny, tiny step forward in decolonizing early child education on the terms of our people. I want to thank you all for listening to me, and I hope to speak with those of you who join um, our session later on today, and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Saratha, for your uh, very insightful and I think a personal presentation on your experiences and, and the work that you're doing, and I think uh, the goals you're trying to accomplish with your academic work, as well as your work in the community and with your family. We really appreciate it. Now we'll welcome our panel of early childhood professionals. We are joined by Chelsea Finch of the Seneca Nation, Randy Atakni of the Comanche Nation, and Wadi Galiskawi from the Cherokee Nation. Welcome to everyone. 
We'd like to give you all a moment to introduce yourselves and briefly share just a few successes or challenges that your early childhood workforce is experiencing. So let's start with Chelsea and then we'll go to Randy and then Wadi. Over to you. Chelsea? Chelsea, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Yep, I'm here, sorry. Are you on mute still, Chelsea? Nope. Can you hear me? It's me, it's Chelsea and Liz. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. No, okay, can hear sorry. You. Hello, you. my name is Chelsea Finch. Um, I'm the director at uh, Seneca Arts and Learning Center with the Seneca Nation. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the uh, Seneca Nation um, Snipe um, clan. Uh, I reside on the territory. Um, I have three young boys and um, a fiance. Um, I've been working with the nation for almost nine years. Um, in this position, I've been here a little over two years. Um, and what was the question that you had asked? Yes, I thought, well, we would first introduce yourself, which you've done, but then briefly share maybe a, a success or a challenge that your early childhood workforce is experiencing. So I would say kind of a little bit of both. I think after COVID, we are having a hiring crisis. Um, so I think one of the uh, successes from that. Um, we have uh, quality staff now. Um, we have uh, the most higher education this building has ever seen. Um, and I believe it's 36 that are currently enrolled into higher education. Um, we have a partnership with Bay Mills Community College um, and um, which provides tuition free education to early childhood um, teachers and staff. Um, so I know with COVID, obviously that was, you know, we had that crisis and it was um, tough times and to come to the end of it and all the successes that we've uh, seen recently has been beneficial. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We look forward to hearing more from you. Uh, let's go to Randy. Uh, uh, Marawaka. Randy I'm Randy Talkney and I'm from uh, Oklahoma from the Comanche Nation and I work at the Comanche Nation Language Department as the director and um, I have uh, two young children I have a two-year-old and a four-month-old <laughs> and I uh, speak specifically Comanche to them. And that's one of the things that I feel is very important just as a person in language, but also a person who uh, grew up in, in a traditional environment to where, you know, I may have not had the language from my parents, but my grandparents were very um, instrumental in trying to preserve our language um, from the, you know, foundings of, of, of our committees and things that have gone on in our, um, in our tribe before we had our language department. So I'm very proud of my uh, background in that. Also, uh, so with our early childhood um, um, department recently, um, they have opened up a new uh, five-star facility here in the in Lawton, uh, Fort Sill area. And they have um, a, had many successes along the way. I know that opening the, that facility had taken a long time coming, especially after COVID, um, trying to get all of the licensing and all of the um, specs for the building, but it's like a ground up operation. So uh, we're very proud of that as a nation that, that we have that available to our people. And we also have another, it's a non-state uh, um a facility that's there on our tribal headquarters and it's called our Onakani. And that is uh, where we have our, it's our baby for our, for our little ones. And so um, 
we definitely, the, the, the push for language in those spaces is very important and vital. Um, and we also have another facility that's a state funded facility in my hometown of Apache where I live. And uh, they have a, that's where my daughter goes. <laughs> and and uh, the, I think the challenge is, is again, is gonna try to, is gonna be the um, hiring, you know, situation we have always seem to have a, I sit on panels for the, for their um, hiring often, and it's like just getting the qualified candidates. But the success of that is once we do have the candidates that are in there, um, in those seats that they're the continuing, um, their education is very supported by the um, early childhood program. So, um, and I look forward to again, visiting and, and talking a little more later. So thank you. Ada. Uh Oh, thank you so much, Randy. Your children are so lucky to have you, to hear that language at home and uh, to carry on that tradition. Uh, just a quick question. Um, so are you a first language speaker? I, I wish, I would love that. Now I'm a second language learner. Um, I'm currently uh, through our certification process, which as a language director, that's something that I get to help and now and assist in, in implementing um, a better uh, system for um, certifying speakers. But as of right now, I'm a certified as a level three advanced language uh, mm -hmm. instructor. But I feel like that's very arbitrary in a way because uh, I'm always going to be learning. And um, I think that... Uh, the, I'm learning along with my my babies, and so it's mm -hmm. so much more fun. <laughs> yes, yes, that that is a that is a symbiotic relationship. Yes. That's, that's such a wonderful thought. All right, let's turn it over to Wadi from Cherokee Nation. Siyo nagadumu, ani sa hindi ka giyam, may gasa wadi ka liskay sa lakdan dawdong. Now, Jig Telepatinam, I said that you had a deal tossy out Tessie Dolan. I guess, and telling me I give money his teacher like the Gadel. Stay Chalak to Money School, I said that Ganel D. My name is Wade or Ryan Mackey, and Wadegali Scale is my Cherokee name, and I get to use that at work and in my community. Um, most of the time, that's what I go by. It's not my check cashing name, though. So uh, my legal name is Ryan Mackey, and, and I'm really honored to be able to present. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, ANA, for, for this opportunity. We moved into what we call the, the Durban Feeling Language Center about two years ago. It's about 52,000 um, you know, square feet. It's a, it's a huge building. We're used to something much smaller. All of our language programs used to be scattered in, in various facilities and throughout different departments. But about four years ago, our administration consolidated all of our language programs into one department. And um, the Durban Feeling Language Center is the home of the Cherokee Nation Language Department. And technically, the Durban Feeling Language Center is the Durban Feeling Child Development Center. That's technically what it is. Everything that goes on within our building, all of our language programs are pointed towards the development of early childhood speakers. Our children are true bilinguals. We have a six month program that we call Baby Immersion that, um, that we, we've only been operating for about a year, but already we've had brilliant success. Well, it's really the the children themselves that are brilliant. They're six weeks old all the way to five years old, and they are learning Cherokee. They are true bilinguals. We have an immersion school that's about 20 years old. It was moved to the center as well, and uh, it's becoming more and more successful. For a while, we took a detour, and we were too concerned about language proficiency for English when it came to literacy. And um, but what we really believed is that if we really deeply developed our Cherokee language speaking ability for our children and their literacy alongside it, then those academic skills would transfer to English. But the concern was um, with some of our leaders at the time, as well as uh, the parents, that our kids were falling behind. So they really strongly suggested that we, we have kind of a bilingual focus with uh, English as kind of a backup. And it caused our Cherokee language proficiency to slip. And 
learning two languages at the same time, going over the same academic concepts in each language slowed us down. We've uh, reconfigured ourselves and doubled down on the idea of Cherokee first. And so we do speak Cherokee to our kids. They learn Cherokee literacy. And in the process, their English proficiency is also developing because their academic and literacy skills are transferring. We believe that um, in order to have good teachers for our immersion school, not only do we have to employ first language speakers, which those are our stars, those are our treasures, but we've learned that second language learners, second language speakers are foundational to a successful future program. Our elders that speak Cherokee are uh, ready to retire and, and they are reluctant to do so because they want to leave the responsibility in capable and skillful hands. And so we have a Cherokee language master apprentice program to teach adult speakers, second language learners. We started this about 10 years ago. We've been successful. We've graduated nearly 40 folks. About half of them uh, work for our, our school um, or our baby immersion program, either as direct teachers, teachers assistants, paraprofessionals, curriculum developers, uh, curriculum specialists. But uh, some of them we send right back to the adult program to help teach more teachers. That's the um, thing that they've actually put me over more recently. It's my job to be responsible for the management of our adult master apprentice program to ensure that we have successful teachers. Very recently, um, we are piloting a program. Um, we're actually developing it. We haven't even started the piloting process. Um, we're, we're really technically in development. There is some practice going on, but the gist is we are transferring um, a lot of our early childhood programs from an English focus to a Cherokee focus. We need certified instructors for that. People that are certified and trained in early childhood development, our Head Start programs, all of those things have primarily been in English, but we're making a shift starting with our baby immersion program to teach Cherokee and Cherokee to our youngest Cherokee learners. And to do that, we have to have people that can get down and roll on the floor and play with the kids. We do have elders there, and that's very valuable because they have the most accurate, the most complicated and advanced uh, language that, that is possible. But our second language folks are being relied upon to be the direct um, instructors and delivery of language lessons in context through cultural activities. And we're going to start a master apprentice program that is focused on um, preparing early childhood development teachers and uh, instructors, educators for, for this field. And, and we're rolling that out probably next year. And, um, and we need 16 new teachers right off the bat. So, so we, we always start behind the, the eight ball, so to say. So we're trying to catch up and and get things going. I don't think thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for that introduction, Wadi. I've actually had the great honor of visiting the Durban Feeling Language Center. I saw the classrooms, the little babies uh, learning, but I also saw math being taught in Cherokee, and it's pretty awesome to see and uh, your master apprentice program is really awesome as well. So, so now I'd like to get into the question uh, and answer portion of this program. Uh, we've got lots of different questions here. I'm just going to share a few, but uh, we're not gonna get to everything, uh, but mindful that we've got three panelists here. Um, uh, let's see how much we can get through. So I'd like to start with uh, Chelsea, uh, I'll go back to you. Could you tell us your long-term vision for the Seneca Native Early Childhood Workforce? How does how are you planning? And you've talked a little bit about work after COVID. How are you how are you developing your uh, your vision for the workforce? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. I said something about starting a video, so I wasn't sure. Um, so I would say that um, um, 
having educated staff, not just uh, streamlined degrees, but with culture and language integrated into our current curriculum that we're using right now. Um, I say that would probably be the, the the main one. And I don't know if Liz wants to touch on anything either. Yeah, I think our, our short-term goal right now in the present is getting our staff to where we need them to be. Chelsea had touched a little bit earlier on coming out of COVID and being in that hiring crisis and just needing to open the doors and kind of hiring anyone that was willing to come to work. And then right now we're just getting them up to where we need them to be for quality level. Our future goals would be to you know, have those educated staff, retain those educated staff and keep them here, but then also find ways to pay them to not just be educated with their degrees, but but to learn the language um, to the point where they can teach it, to learn the culture where they can teach it, uh, incorporate families into the classrooms, and like she said, be able to take our current curriculum. Right now we use the creative curriculum and be able to integrate our culture and language into that um, both both with the kids. I think those are our future goals. Yeah, and, and we, we share a, a building with our immersion program. Um, so it's getting them involved in um, uh, working in the classrooms more too. Um, we're part of a, a tribal early learning initiative. So they have been really helpful too to spend our, our CCDF funds. Um, so just adding on that. That's fantastic. Um, over to you, Randy. What strategies have um, have you used for recruiting Native professionals into early childhood development roles? You yourself seem to have come up through ECD, and, and maybe there's a story of what brought you there, but uh, from now, uh, as, as a manager, how do you uh, recruit Native professionals and how can programs like yours ensure that you know you're attracting individuals who are as, as passionate about this work as you are? In all honesty, we have had to grow these individuals uh, from our programming, starting from as my background um, originally uh, was in in a child welfare um, back when I first uh, began working in tribal uh, government. And then uh, that was a really tough situation and a, a tough uh, job. And I admire and I give full salute to those who, who work in that field. And so I transferred into uh, what it would be uh, after school programming uh, for youth ages from six to 18. And uh, that's been now going over a decade, going into 13 years ago uh, that I started with the nation. and. The, the youth that were in that group and the young, the young um, uh, children were six at the time, you know, bolstering their identity with our, um, our focuses on culture and language and spirituality and wellness. So with all of those, those factors, we have to grow these individuals. And now they're at this ripe place where they can be, um, they can come into these programs such as the language department and in early childhood. And I, I think of, of several successes, uh, but there's one individual, like I, I knew her since she was six years old and she is going to be going into the teaching field. And, and originally she was like, I really didn't want to go this direction. She said, but I want to work with our young babies. And so she's, she's utilizing her cultural knowledge, her language background where she was learning as a, as a student herself. And now she's going to be, um, coming back into that so and I admire so much of uh, what the Cherokees do I, I follow you I follow the Cherokees on how they uh, run their programming from their uh their their Cherokee seed program I just I love all of uh, I love all of these things because that's exactly where it starts with our, our young people um so following and tracking these these individuals who have promise and have um, this this identity of, of what it is to be Comanche and what it is to 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 value our um, our our heritage you know those are the ones we really have to keep track on and make sure that we have a welcome space for them to be make sure that we leave room for them and not not um, um, keep gatekeep anyone from being in, in these seats that way one day will need to sit at. 
uh, always bring them to the table as if you are, you know, and we always have this thing about, you know, we keep our kids at the kid table. We don't need to do that now. We, they need to be sitting with us and uh, utilizing them in our uh, master uh, uh, teacher apprentice um, models, bring them in. Cause I was, I tell all of our staff here at the language department, especially it's like we, everybody needs a, a, uh, a buddy, an apprentice, somebody who's going to take over their spot. Even if you don't think that you're going to be leaving anytime soon, the knowledge that you can gain uh, while having somebody to uh, work with right beside you is going to be crucial, crucial for us to have long-term success. So um, was that the question? <laughs> that, that's good. That's good. Recruiting Native professionals into ECD I'll turn it over to you, Wadi, and give us a few thoughts. I've also visited the Cherokee Little Seeds program, and it is really a very almost sacred space when you walk into that uh, classroom. What are your strategies for recruiting Native professionals? And you've got such a large footprint, so you need so many teachers. One of the first things that we did is we we're engaged in a community readiness model. It was suggested by uh, a process that we had gone through when we were engaged in another a a grant, which was um, the it was it was the NLCC co-partnership program, uh -huh. um, Native language community coordination. There were there were five of us in that cohort. And as a part of that five-year process, we were required to do community readiness assessments and, and which caused us to engage in the community in a way that we hadn't previously done before. On a monthly basis, sometimes every two weeks, we would throw a big hog fry and we would uh, invite all the people in that community to come and eat for free. We would give medals to our first language speakers and we would have them sign an archival quality book. And um, so we took a role of our first language speakers. And at that time, you know, I guess about eight years ago is when it was, maybe not quite that long ago, seven years ago, we, um, we determined that there were about 2,200 first language Cherokee speakers. And um, we're now down to about 1,500, but we were able to track the loss of our first language speakers as they passed on. We were able to track their ages. We were able to track their locations. And um, and celebrate their lives and and the fact that they were indeed uh, the masters of our language in the process of of recognizing who they are and and what they what they mean to us as a people. Uh, we got in close contact with them, and uh, when COVID did hit, we had contact information, and we called them personally and asked them to come in and, and take. The vaccines. Over 80% of our first language speaker population was vaccinated in the first three months because of this process. This also put us in contact with them when it came time to apply for um, jobs for our programs. We needed first language speakers and um, a lot of them don't have emails. A lot of them don't have internet connectivity. So we had to contact them and go to them and, um, and ask them if they wanted to apply and help them through the process of applying because our entire application system is online for Cherokee Nation, which does not serve the needs of our elders in our community, but it, it serves the majority of the workforce. So we had to make special accommodations for our first language speakers. So we found retired um, educators. We found retired people that needed to re-up their certification, but they had already had quite a bit of experience and they became our models. And with them, we developed um, paraprofessionals and professionals that we could integrate into the system, send them back to school after they would go through our immersion programs, both adult um, and graduates of our immersion school also went through this process. And, and once that we developed their language, then we would send them to get the right certifications or, uh, or certificates to, to prove that that they could perform in a Western system. Not everybody went back to school. So some of the folks just did enough certification to be in the classroom, to pass a background check, to be qualified and prepared to teach. The majority of our, our employees in re this regard have been self-developed, but, but this was built upon the shoulders of first language speakers that we had to literally recruit. 
Wow, that's a beautiful story. Really beautiful and integrating the multi-generation, you know, into the into the classroom, into the teaching. Chelsea, if I could uh, go back to you, I think you said earlier that um, you have a lot of people in secondary education, is that correct? And wondering, uh, my question though is, is how uh, can early childhood programs create meaningful career pathways? So looking at the whole spectrum of of those individuals going off to college, coming back to the community, serving in a meaningful role. Can you share a bit about how early childhood programs can create meaningful careers for them that encourage a long-term commitment and, and, and professional growth as well? I would say that um, um, we currently have partnerships with um, other colleges. Um, right now we have, um, it's called the HOPE um, grant that we have with Bay Mills Community College. And as I touched on earlier, it's a tuition-free um, education. Um, it is a Native American um, college too. So they uh, have um, a bunch of opportunities for um, scholarships and they specialize with uh, federal um, tribes. Um, but with, with this program, though, they have, uh, like I said, tuition-free, they have an on-site tutor, um, they have a free resource, um, um, book library uh, right on site. Um, it's a partnership that we have with our, our other territory, too. Uh, we have two um, daycare centers, one here on Allegheny and one in Cattaraugus. Um, but um, just being in that atmosphere with um, all of our staff, um, and I think that's really what was the the um, motivating uh, factor was everybody was getting enrolled into school and wanting to they're they're hearing about this homework or that homework and um, what class are you in and it just it was kind of like a um, infectious really. yeah it was really infectious and um, created that environment that people just wanted to be a part of that um, and um, just to uh, contribute to um, those meaningful and, and positive relationships and being able to know um, and um, contribute into the, the classrooms and um, whether that would be with families, parents, uh, the children, coworkers, um, you know, I think we all learn from each other. And um, I don't know if that answered your, your question, but um, I think the biggest thing is having too is uh, the mentors, you know, um, it started with just a group of, of uh, um, admin staff and a few teachers, and then it turned into like the whole building. Nice. And, um, now we have community members that are asking and um, the, the Seneca Nation departments and um, uh, our HR offices. It's it's because they don't just do uh, early childhood. They do all sorts of um, degrees and they work with uh, federal uh, recognized um uh, yes, I, I mean, I'm sure if that answered your question or not. Yeah. That's good. That's very good. And I love that idea that it's infectious, that we're going to school, we're going to uh, not just acquire this knowledge and skill, we're going to bring it back. Randy, you mentioned that you have two very young children. And, um, you know, with the field of Native Early Childhood Development, and the busyness around all the work that goes into being with children, teaching children. We know that burnout is, you know, part of the, we, it's part of the calculation. You know, we just need to know that, uh, that we're facing many, many challenges, uh, both ourselves and with our teachers and our staff. And what strategies do you use or have you found to be effective to address teacher staff burnout and, and, and personally as well? And, and, and then additionally, maybe how do some of these programs help support an environment that promotes mental health and well-being? Well, thank you for, for that question. Um, with... Uh, I can speak from the personal experience first, and then I can expound on that. 
personally, the setting of boundaries is crucial. Um, I've worked in other fields where, you know, you take the work with you and it, and it seeps into your, your personal life to where you can't really um, differentiate. And, you know, we, that was something I, as a young person I learned um, that was very, it was not beneficial to my, to my well being, And as I've uh, grown into uh, the person that I am today, I know that boundaries are crucial and to teach those boundaries, um, even if it's with young, young children, that's something that they, they have to learn, um, but to also stick to those things. And, um, I am guilty of even right now, I, if you look behind me, I have a rocking chair and, uh, you know, a bassinet <laughs> for, for, all, <laughs> for my, uh, there you go. <laughs> so, because, uh, I, I do sometimes bring my, you know, not do as I say, not as I do, but I bring my family to these places, but that's also something that is important that this, even if you are working, um, it's okay to bring your families in and your children to these places because this is where uh, our language is nurtured and we nurture our, our family. So being able to have an administration that is supportive of that um, is, is extremely important. Um, our, our ECD staff, ECDC, ECDC staff, they have uh, the capability, if they do have young children that, or if they have, um, that they can utilize the um, child care facilities for those children. Um, I know even within our own department, I say, you know, we're about families because that's where our language is housed within our homes. So it's, we can't bring our own families here. That's, 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 uh, that's not good. We need to be able to have that welcome space for them. And then also knowing that after this day is done, language goes with us at home, but also to know that the stresses of the job shouldn't go home with us. <laughs> so to avoid burnout, that was one of the things. Have hobbies that you do, even if it is in language, have those hobbies. Um, have that time set aside to relax with your family and enjoy them. And, and that's that to me is always going to be a, a huge um I'm always going to be a huge proponent of, of being able to take your language home, but not the stresses of work home. Um, but that's one of the things, even with our, our staff, uh, with our ECDC, that, that, that making sure that they're welcome, that the, your families are welcome in, in our workspace, um, but not to take up too much headspace when we go home. <laughs> mm. so. You're so right about that. I did a lot of traveling in my uh, early career and wherever I could, I'd love to bring my daughters with me because one, I miss them so much, but two, they were exposed to uh, to so many tribal communities. Uh, it was mm -hmm. enriching them as much as, you know, filling a need that I have. So that's really beautiful. And I love that you have a bassinet in your office. Uh, I, I took my uh, my daughter and my son with me to Washington D.C. when or when when we went to our um, our convening, yes. and it was very important to keep them with me because yes. of the language aspect, but also you know the nurturing side of me. Mm -hmm. I you know that, that's something that is in is crucial. Uh, so that's what it, it's. I'm glad that we have an administration that is supportive of that. So. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And you need to have agency to say, this is what I need as well. Perfect. Well, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists for this discussion. I actually have like 14 more questions, but we're just not going to have time to get to them. But I'd love to share you with everybody else on this webinar. So we'll move into our breakout rooms and each of our panelists will lead a breakout room discussion. Um, so uh, we'll move there. You'll be able to choose which room you want to join. And Saratha Largi will be in room one. Chelsea Finch, you're going to be in room two. Randy Atakni in room three. And Wadi, you're in room four. So please feel free to ask them questions and we'll join uh, and wrap up in about 15 minutes.
Do I do we just wait here until we go into the room or do we oh wait there it is never mind thank you Fred, I think if Fred, I think if you can, yeah. If you can go I, ahead and put people in rooms, that would help. Thank you. The so put them in any room. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Fred.
I don't know if our breakout rooms have ended yet. I think they have. They have. I was in your room, Wadi, and um, I was also in the room with Chelsea, and I just, I wanted to jump in again, too, but uh, it was just such amazing conversation, and you said something that really stood out to me, and that is, <clears throat> we need to think like our ancestors, and the work that we're doing is really showing and demonstrating in really a beautiful personal way that we're taking care of each other. And, and those are just beautiful thoughts to, uh, to take away with us as, as we end this session. So <clears throat> sadly, and I think there's so much more to talk about. Um, this concludes our second session of four webinar series. It means though that we have two more left to go. And I wanna say thank you so much to everyone for joining, to our wonderful panelists and speakers. Um, I'd like to remind you that our next session entitled The Power of Data in, early, in Native Early Childhood Development will be Thursday, October 3rd, again at three o'clock um, Eastern time. We're really going to be exploring what does that mean, data, and how do we use that data uh, both like in federal grants, but how does it really show us the impacts of the work that we're doing? We'll explore also the importance of collecting and analyzing the data and also using it in the context of what we call native sovereign, I should say native data sovereignty and how we report again, the impacts in a both quantitative and qualitative way, which I think is so important to us as uh, grant makers. So obviously all of this is to enhance the effectiveness of your programs and drive really informed decision-making in early childhood education and child care. So with that, I'll just uh, say good day to all of you. And thank you again for joining us. Please come back. We are going to have some more fantastic discussion for you next time. Bye now. <laughs>